Welcome to the I Give an F1 podcast. I'm Allison. And I'm Lynette. Welcome back, everybody. Today we have a special episode. As you may know, we started a Formula One Fantasy League this year. So we have a special guest here with us today to chat F1 Fantasy and to hopefully get you guys some strategies as we head into Miami. Yeah. So everyone, um, please welcome Adam to the show. Adam is part of F1 Fantasy HQ on Instagram. So go give him a follow. He has some great tips, insights into fantasy. Adam. Hey. <laughs> hey, Allison. Thanks so much for having me on. Hi, Lynette. It's so nice to meet the two of you and to be on the show. I've been a big fan for a while. Thanks. Well, um, we definitely want everyone to get to know you. We already know kind of your story. Um, but yeah, go ahead and tell us. Like, We want to know all about you, so give us the rundown. All right. So we'll start with maybe how I got into F1 in the first place, because I had a pretty yeah. cool initiation into the sport. I studied abroad in Melbourne back in 2007, and we had this friend group that did everything together, and we bought tickets to the Grand Prix at Albert Park. And so at that point, I had only seen Michael Schumacher highlights on ESPN, so I didn't really know anything about the sport. But the morning of the Grand Prix, my friends were all decked out in Ferrari gear. So I just Googled, who's the top rival for Ferrari? And it was McLaren. So the McLaren team at the time was Fernando Alonso, fresh off of back-to-back -back world titles, and Lewis Hamilton, who was a rookie. So that day, I blindly became a McLaren fan. And since Australia was the first race on the calendar, and will be again next year, I got to see Lewis's first Grand Prix as my first race and in person. So that was my, That's really my special. introduction to the sport. Yeah, that's a, that's a good intro there. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. I love that you like are such a guy and you had to just be like, you know, a Do contrarian. <laughs> yeah, you had to be a contrarian. You just had to go against the grain. <laughs> and it, it really lucked out. Luckily, you know, Lewis has just been so incredible since then. So I picked a really, really good day to start following him. Yeah. So are you still a McLaren <laughs> fan or are you now more just a Lewis fan? So I go where Lewis goes, but I do always have a soft spot for his previous team. So I'm a Mercedes fan now. I'm going to move over to being part of the Lufosi next year with Ferrari, but I'll always have a soft spot for Toto and George, for McLaren, for Fernando. I have yeah. a I have a lot of drivers I enjoy. Wow, oh Lufosi. I haven't heard that Lufosi. one. <laughs> That's new. We've got to adopt that. Maybe we make a t-shirt. Oh, God. <laughs> do it. Um, so tell us about Fantasy F1 headquarters. Yeah. So last season, I started to realize how quickly not only F1 was growing in the States, but the number of people playing the fantasy game nearly doubled from 2021 to 2022. And when I looked around, there were maybe three or four content creators on just one social media platform. And then all the explanations on how to play the game and strategies on how to handle your team week to week, they were all tucked away on Discord somewhere. So they're really hard to find. And I had just finished in the top 1000 in the world the year before. So I wondered if more fans wanted a website where you could learn how to play the game and get tips and tricks. So I started F1FantasyHQ.com and all of my socials to give that, that content to people. And things have really picked up since then. So like you, I partnered with FanAmp and we started the Fantasy Formula podcast along with some other great creators like Terry, who was on this show recently. He's been so great to work with. I'm, I'm really glad he joined our show. And oh my gosh, yes. The, the fantasy formula was picked by F1 to host a featured league this year. So we have over 100,000 teams in our league, which has been such a thrill for us. And then that was a springboard to getting F1 TV personalities on our show. So we had Chris McCarthy, who's the commentary lead for Formula 3 and F1 Kids. And then for China, we had Laura Winter on, which was such a thrill for us. They were both I saw that. It's, I saw it's that. picked up really fast in a year. It's been It's been really fun. That's amazing. I'm so happy for you guys. Have, um, have you ever done any F1 or like fantasy leagues for any other sports or just Formula One? So I'm a lifelong fantasy NFL player. I think I've been playing for almost 20 years now. So I got mm -hmm. into it that way. But then I think I, this is the only other fantasy sport I've played before. And I've been playing for this is my third year now. Mm, okay. So I actually started playing fantasy NFL as well. Like that was back in like right outside of college days for me. Like I was so into football, like NFL fantasy. So this caught my eye as soon as I heard there was like an F1 fantasy group. I was like, okay, like, and I started getting invited to leagues. I was like, I'm willing to try this. Like I had no idea this existed. <laughs> you know, we um, got um, a press release last week when the, the Joe mini league was released and it said that female participation in F1 fantasy is up 6% year over year. So I think it's great shows like this that are hosting their own league led by powerful females in motorsport like yourself. I think that's part of what's growing this game too. So 
we have you to hey. pay for it. Yeah, totally. I can't say I'm high up in your uh, league, but <laughs> you, on the other hand, I was looking this up, were ranked like 800 and something out of 1.6 million. Is that right? Yeah. So my first year playing the game, I finished in the top 1,000 in the world. And then last year I was 2,600 or so out of 2.4 million. So I'm in the top 0.1% of the first few years I played. Wow. Well, the consistency <laughs> shows that it's not a fluke, <laughs> that there is strategy to this. And that's why we're excited to have you because we're like, we need to learn more from the experts. <laughs> I'm happy to help. Um, so can you give us like a few really basic, like newcomer to F1 fantasy, some like basic tips for whenever we're setting our lineups for the week, just overall, like how we're looking at the specific races and the drivers. Sure. So I think my number one tip for this year is to start with your constructors and build your team up from there because your constructors get bonuses for sending both drivers into Q3 and for the fastest pit stops. So they score more than the drivers do. In the case of Red Bull and Ferrari, they've scored 85 points on just pit stops. They've scored another 95 points on just putting drivers into Q3. So these two constructors are a huge source of points, so that's where I'd start. And then after that, pick the best driver you can afford for the 2x boost, and then whatever you can afford for the rest of your team. But if you want a slightly more advanced tip, there was a group earlier this year that cracked the code on how price changes are made. So at the end of each race week, the scores are finalized and the drivers and constructors could gain or lose value. And someone figured out the method behind it. So now we can predict which drivers go up in value each week. And so if you want to dive into that deeper and nerd out, I've got an Instagram reel and an article on F1FantasyHQ.com that digs into it. But basically, this sets us up with a path to growing our cost cap and affording better drivers later in the season. Wow, that's awesome. Um, so how many times you pretty much switch your lineup every week, correct? For the most part, I try to, it, I think I, I tinker around a lot with the the back marker drivers. Cause usually after a few weeks, one of them's bound to run into some trouble. So I try to move them around a bit. There's also the ability to carry a third transfer into the next race week. If you use zero or one of your transfers, you can carry one into the next week and then make more transfers. So sometimes mm -hmm. I'll leave my team as is week to week and then carry a transfer in the following race and then make a lot more changes. Interesting. Okay. I didn't even realize you could carry a transfer. So you, we have to teach Allison th these things. <laughs> <laughs> we are babies when it comes to this. <laughs> hey, that's okay. Um, okay. So our next question was, um, who do you think is the most valuable driver? I know we've talked about constructors, which may be my next question. Um, but who do you think is the most valuable driver as a fantasy pick other than Max? That's assuming Max is the most valuable pick, right? <laughs> right. I think he, yeah, he has been so far. He's been a monster these last few weeks. But I think that's a really important question because for teams that took my last advice, start with Red Bull and Ferrari usually can't afford Max. There's only a, a top right. few teams that can afford him. So then who's the next best driver? For me, that's Charles Leclerc. He's just been really terrific this year. He was leading the game in scoring before China because of that Max DNF in Australia. He's got multiple fastest laps. He's got a driver of the day from Japan. And when we look at the value gained this season, Charles leads all drivers with 2.9 million in value gain. So he's helping our teams grow so that our cost cap can afford better drivers as the season goes on. And he's a great source of points. I think on a points per race basis, he's only three points per race behind Max. So he's having a, a oh, heck of a year. That's amazing. And for the value, for sure. Absolutely. Who would you say would be maybe the least valuable driver? One that you probably oh, wouldn't gosh. want on there. Daniel Ricardo is having himself a stinker of a year. He's in the bottom two for fantasy points, points per race, points per million dollars of salary, um, total price gain throughout the season. So he's had a really rough year. A lot of stuff hasn't been his fault. You know, two collisions in a row and back-to-back -back races that were racing incidents and not his fault. So a little bit of bad luck there, but I've just got to stay away from him right now. That's very interesting. Um, I wonder how that translates to like their career. I don't know. I guess I just think of it as like, <laughs> what is their value to the teams or like to F1? I mean, I know that they have like brand deals. They're very, you know, they bring in popularity and sponsors and all that stuff. But like, I wonder if it changes the value of them as a driver. <laughs> 
it's a good question because I think the game does correlate really well with with how the performance is on track. It it rewards things like positions gained and overtakes and can these drivers come back when they have a tough qualifying session. And drivers that fail to do that tend to not stick around for very long. And drivers that do find themselves moving into the the midfield and then the upper team. So I think it does correlate. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. So I guess from that, my next question would be like, who would be someone that you feel like most people would undervalue as a fantasy driver? He's not very well liked, but Lance Stroll is a, is a great fantasy value because, um, you know, diving into how some of the cost cap changes work, the drivers and constructors are all grouped into three pricing tiers. So tier A has just max, tier B has your front runners and tier C has some of your your bottom eight or nine drivers and strolls at the top of that. And so he's been gaining value faster than anybody on uh, Williams or Sauber or some of those back marker teams. And then he's also been putting up some pretty decent points He had that one DNF earlier in the season, but he's been qualifying really low, gaining a lot of places and making a lot of overtakes. So he's been a sneaky source of points in the early part of the season. Yeah. The overtakes, that's where it's coming from. Hmm. Number one in all of F1 fantasy and overtakes. Yeah, because it's like he qualifies so poorly and then somehow he's better than the back of the pack. So he just ends up, you know, always getting some some points there. Exactly. <laughs> Unless he crashes, which <laughs> that's always a problem. Um, so, okay, that's really good, valuable information. Um, I was curious more if you could teach us a little more about the tokens because I am so confused by the tokens. So, <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, okay. you have six of these, and we can only use them one time each throughout the year. And you can only use one chip on a particular weekend. You can't stack them up. And so, one that I recommend the most for a sprint weekend, and we're in between two sprint races, is Limitless because Limitless allows you to make as many transfers as you want and it throws out the cost cap so you can get the most stacked team you want. Oh, and nice. on a sprint weekend, there are three events that you can or a score points. So you want to do that with a, a really stacked team on a sprint weekend. So I recommend no negative. I mean, um, limitless, limitless early in the yeah. er, early in the season when you have these sprint races because you can score a ton of points. That's um, awesome. Then there are other chips like no negative. I was starting to get into no negative because I used it in China. That takes any line item from your driver's scoring that's negative and sets it to zero. So if you lose positions, if you DNF. If you don't qualify in the, the qualifying session, you'll lose points, and that sets all of that to zero. So when I used it last weekend, Hulkenberg lost nine places, Batas lost three, Batas had a DNF. All that stuff got wiped off the board for me. It saves you a lot of points. Yeah, and I almost used pick, it last last week. And <laughs> you have to pick it before the race, or can you yes. use it after? Okay, you have to use it so before the race. When your lineups lock, you have to have your chip in for five out of the six chips. The last one is called the final fix. So once the lineups lock, you can make one change to your team at any point. So on a regular weekend, it'll be between qualifying and the Grand Prix. On a sprint weekend, it could be between the sprint and qualifying or between qualifying and the grand prix and that that's not a chip it is yeah oh, the, that's final a chip. Fix, the final fix the final, final fix, fix is one of those okay. chips you can use only once per year and a good example of this was last year carlos signs there was a race where he crashed in free practice or qualifying and he ended up right at the last minute not participating in the grand prix so anybody who had signs in that race needed to use the final fix to get him out for someone who was running okay i like that so that's three. And then don't we have like three, three X? Yes. So the three X boost will just triple the score of any one driver, but then the two X boost that we get every week has to move to a second driver. So you need to have enough budget to do a good three X driver, a good two X driver and not skimp on the constructors. So I, I recommend people use this later in the season. And again, like the limitless chip, I recommend you use it on a sprint weekend because you get three scoring events, get the most points possible out of it. Interesting. Well, so I the, screwed myself because I already used the three, three, <laughs> three one. You're learning. You're learning. It's okay. <laughs> so then there's two chips left. There is autopilot, which will automatically move your 2x boost to whoever scores the most points on your team. So maybe if you've got Charles on your team with the 2x chip, but he is taking an engine penalty and he starts in the back of the grid, he might have a tough day or he could have a great day. Maybe you buffer it by putting the, the autopilot on there. So it moves to the next best driver on your team if charles can't move his way up the grid okay and then the last chip which one haven't we talked about oh the wild card 
Ah, the wild card is like half of the limitless chips. You can make just unlimited changes to your team without taking any transfer penalties because you get two free transfers every race. You can carry a third one that's unused from a previous week, and then it's 10 points per transfer after that. Okay, so wait. So what's the difference? Sorry, I'm, I'm lost. So the difference between the limitless one and the, the wild, wild card, card one. Both you... of them allow you to make unlimited transfers. Mm -hmm. Limitless lets you pick whatever drivers you want with no budget. Got it. Oh, okay. I wanted to jump back real quick. You mentioned that um, the overtakes is kind of what gets you the most points. Is there anything else that you would say maybe comes in second or something else that you can kind of look at um, when choosing a driver besides who would get the most overtakes? Hmm. I think that's, that's definitely the biggest one for me. And then also I look at is there a driver that could be in a position to get driver of the day? Because that's very emotional. It's a, it's a fan voted thing. So Carlos, when he came back from his appendectomy, seemed like a surefire thing and he ended up getting it. If Charles starts a few positions lower than he normally would, or if Lando's getting upgrades and you think they might challenge for a podium, those are guys that tend to win driver of the day. So if you can line up your team to steal that extra 10 points, I always try to do that too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good tip. I like that. You're giving us all the tips to beat you. Yeah. Although Good. you are win I want, winning, I want more league, competition. So. This is yeah. great. <laughs> you're winning. You're winning our competition. So we will be sending you our merch probably at the end of the season. <laughs> Good. I want to be back on this show next year, rocking a big IJF. Yeah. Show. <laughs> We'd give it to you anyway, even if you lost. <laughs> oh, good. Should we look at our lineups? <laughs> Ooh. Um, I think that I need your tips for this weekend for Miami. Can you give us any tips like for this specific weekend and this specific race? Ooh. Um, if you were to use the limitless chip, if you still have it, I really like Lando and McLaren this weekend. The MCL 38 is due to get some upgrades that I think could be a really good follow-up to Lando's P2 performance in China last time out. So I think he'll be a sneaky good pick for our limitless teams. And then a little bit lower down the grid, I would keep an eye on the Alpine drivers because Ocon received a new floor for China and he finished P11, which was the best result that Alpine's had all year. And we know that the floor in these modern F1 cars can generate up to 70% of the downforce. So that one change could be the difference between Alpine making that step up. And since it works so well for Ocon, I expect Gasly to get the floor this weekend in Miami and potentially he'll be the next backmarker driver to move up the grid more. So if your budget's limited, that could be a good guy to get in. Okay, thanks. I'm keeping all these notes. <laughs> I'm coming for you, Adam. No, good. I am good. 19th in our league, so <laughs> not coming for you. But okay, that's great. Good. I'm glad. See, we're learning. We're learning, Lynette. Um, all right. So we have a couple of other questions because I do want to get into a little bit of news. We've talked a lot about Carlos. And I am very curious where you think, not from a fantasy perspective, from your own perspective, what do you think about the whole Carlos situation and where do you think he's going to end up? He's in a really tough spot right now because could he go to Red Bull with Adrian Newey on his way out the door and Max uncertain for the future? That would be a tough landing spot for him. If he goes to Mercedes for a year to bridge a gap to his Audi contract that, that could be in hand keep that seat warm for Antonelli. Now you have to play with two different teams and get them to all agree on the timelines and money. But now last weekend, we're hearing that now that Hulkenberg is signed with Audi, they're looking at Ocon as a second driver. So I think this is Audi putting the pressure on signs to commit to them, suck it up with Sauber for a year, or else they're going to go with someone else. And then his options are really limited. So I think ultimately Carlos caves signs with Audi, and then he has to make the best of that Sauber next year. Okay. I like your take. Where would so, you like for him to go? Like yeah. it was up to you. Where would you like to see I, him? I love the the whole chaos situation of Max going to Mercedes and Carlos going to Red Bull Lewis at Ferrari, just the whole thing being upside down next year. I think that madness would be really fun. But also if he paired with Max at Red Bull, this could be the first real challenge that Max has had in a while. So I think either of those scenarios would be really fun. I, I just keep thinking if he went to Red Bull next year and he was competing in that car with like against Max, man, that could, that could really shake some things up. Like it doesn't matter where he is in two years, if he's like a contender for a world championship. Oh yeah. It'd be on next year for sure. Yeah. I don't know. Now I'm like, hmm, interesting. <laughs> 
Where so, do you think he's going to end up? Um, so we talked about this last night. Lynette, what did you say you thought maybe um, I'm Red not Bull? sure. Um, I'd like for him to go to Red Bull for that reason to give Max a fight. And I think that's just – it's going to be like the best chance that he has to – fight for the championship, even if Nui leaves. I think they still have a pretty strong team as of now. You know, of course, like if people start to leave, then, you know, that's a different story. But um, even just with Nui leaving, I think that they could still really do something and he could really do something there instead of wasting like a year at Sauber and maybe Audi will be good. Um, I think that would be the best. Yeah. I really feel like he might be burned from like his time at Red Bull from not being given like the the crown jewel of support that they gave max so i you know to me i was thinking more of like a mercedes situation might be good for him but i think in the end with all this pressure from audi i'm feeling like he might end up there as well um but you're right i just think it would be really cool to see him in, in like a red bull so i guess we'll see mercedes would be good too because then we could see that fight between him and george and um yeah maybe the car will be a little bit better as they as they go on this year and maybe next year. So I think those those are like the two options because right now Sauber is just, I feel like we can't really see the vision of, of what's to come with them. Yeah. I need to see a pit stop under five seconds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> under 10 seconds. Come on. <laughs> um, yeah. So what do you think about the whole Adrian Newey situation? He just announced, well, he, he hasn't announced officially, but supposedly the announcement is coming within the next couple of days, hopefully before Miami GP. So where do you think he's going to end up? This is a really fun one to talk about. So at this point, Nui has designed cars for Prost, Mansell, Hakkinen, Vettel, now Max. And this week is the 30th anniversary of the incident that took Senna from us. And Nui designed the Williams that Senna was in that day too. So he's really built cars for all of the legends of the sport. So with that in mind, I can only see him designing a car for Lewis or Fernando. And I think since he's won championships with McLaren, Williams, and Red Bull, Ferrari feels like the last big moment for him to just corner off all of the big legendary teams and legendary drivers in the history of the sport. So I'm thinking Ferrari, but maybe I'm just a, a hopeful Lewis fan that wants to see the pairing. I I agree. I do feel like he's going to end up at Ferrari. I think that you're right. It does fit this like romanticized idea for him and he's done it all. Money's not an option. So like, I feel like Ferrari is perfect for him. <laughs> um, but it would be a big surprise if Aston Martin, I feel like it wouldn't be a big surprise, sorry, if Aston Martin did somehow get him with that limitless budget. You know, they do have um, quite a bit of funding to be able to afford um, and Adrian Newey on their team. So yeah, knows. they have the limitless chip in real life. <laughs> they do. Yeah. Especially with Lance being a non-paid forever driver. <laughs> um, isn't there some sort of a rule where the cost cap does not affect the, it's like the top three, um, personnel on the team. It's like the top three like the two drivers right. and then either the principal or the engineer. Is that correct? And I think that's Newey either falls under that or I think I've heard there are some other shenanigans too, where you can hire him as a contractor or you could hire a company or an LLC that's under him and you can skirt some of those cost cap rolls that way too. So there's a lot of ways you could have Newey and some high end drivers and some good engineers and still all make it work. Yeah. So, I mean, Aston Martin seems to be the best bet money wise, but Ferrari has some options as well. I mean, they have, they have so many limitless amounts of like branding and just, you know, legacy and the idea, the brand, like everything of Ferrari. I feel like it just gives more that's not monetary, even though they do probably have plenty of money as well to pay him. So, um, yeah, Lynette, what do you think? I feel like we talked about this last night, but let's let's recap. Well, I had said that I would like to see him at Aston Martin just to bring a little more uh, competition to the to the field. And, you know, because we have Red Bull, I think Ferrari has been doing pretty well in the past few years and they've been coming a long way on their own. So I'd like to see what they could do on their own and then have Nui at Aston Martin and see what he could do 
with them, see if he could bring them to the top. So yeah, that's what, that's what I'd like to see, but I'm um, sure probably according to, you know, all the chatter and all the rumors, it seems like he's going to Ferrari, but I still feel like, where is it coming from? You know, cause I know they've been saying that he has spoken to Aston Martin and they've made an offer and so has Ferrari. So I, I wonder if a lot of this talk of like, he's going to Ferrari is more just people wanting him to go to Ferrari, but um, like, where exactly is it coming from that it's specifically Ferrari? Mm -hmm. What do you think, Adam, the chances are that this Max team talking to Mercedes team is actually happening? Ooh, Toto's definitely making us believe that it's a real thing. I, I hope it's happening. I, I really like this mayhem scenario where Carlos goes to Red Bull and Max goes to Mercedes. You have the two McLaren drivers in their prime, potentially Newey going to to Aston Martin and Lynette's scenario. Like you could have a lot of power at the top of the grid, which would be super fun. I think in the end, it really comes down to how Max wants to handle his legacy and where he sees the development of the 2026 cars. Because I think he sees a championship this year and probably next year in his sights. And then how does he want to carry that over as Red Bull's development heading in that direction? Or is he tied into his morals and some of that Christian Horner situation? Has it just all become too much drama for him? So it's going to yeah. be a very interesting couple of months. For sure. For sure. So what is, this is like a side note, but what is your dream race to go to? Um, I'm sure you've been to races before, but let's just like, what's a race that you've never been to that you would love to go to? You know, if you asked me a few years ago, I would have said either a beautiful destination like Monaco or a really cool circuit like Spa or Monza. But now that I've become a content creator, I really just want to go to Coda which is not only a really great race to begin with, but I, I saw a lot of people connecting at that race last year. And our community had a lot of meetups and people started building these relationships at Coda last year that grew their connection to the sport. And so after that, I saw people that were hanging out at the race later collaborating and celebrating each other. And I think that would be a really cool way to bring me even closer to the sport and the community that we're all in. So I think Coda is up there for me now. Nice. That's something I didn't expect you to say. <laughs> a lot so of people like, want to go to Coda. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's true. But like, uh, I feel like not many people in America would say that. I feel like it's true. a lot of US fans would want to go somewhere else, right? <laughs> it's true. Um, so are, are, what are your plans? Are you coming down? I don't think I can make Coda work this year. Right now I have plane tickets in a hotel for Vegas, but not race tickets yet. So I'm looking, looking closer to Vegas this year and then Coda next year, but we'll see if kids and my nine to five job and just life cooperate between now and November. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> um, so what races have you been to? Just two. So the bookends are pretty ridiculous. The 2007 Australian Grand Prix, Lewis's debut, and the 2022 Miami Grand Prix. So I've been to this, the inaugural Miami Grand Prix two years ago. It was super fun. I thought the logistics around Hard Rock Stadium were really good. We got in and out easily, had a lot of fun on South Beach. I thought the race itself was a lot of fun. So um, I'm really jealous of the people that are going this week. Uh, yeah, I'm I, I'm seeing a lot of content uh, creators and influencers and podcasters, everyone heading up to Miami this week. And I'm not going to lie, I'm feeling a little bit of FOMO. <laughs> Same. Yeah, hopefully, you know, this time next year, it'll be uh, the three of us on one of those, the, the yachts on the fake water, just doing a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that would be amazing. <laughs> I'm game. Let's just go ahead and buy our flights. <laughs> Let's do it. Lynette, after all this hoopla around Miami and, you know, this, this is now what third year for Miami. Mm -hmm. What do you think Lynette about like the Miami race? And are you more inclined to go now that it's kind of settled down and become more of what it is? Um, I wouldn't say it's like really become anything more from what it, what it seems like, but yeah, I would go for sure. I think I'd go to any race really <laughs> to the majority of them so yeah I, I, it'd be one that I would go to I feel like it's um you know easy to get to like you said I feel like it'd be easy to plan it and the space also kind of spread out how Coda is and easy to get around so yeah I, I would go yeah I feel like now that I know the logistics mm -hmm. are pretty good I'm like hmm now I want to go even more because that was one thing I was like oh Miami is like so tiny I feel like the traffic would be crazy 
So yeah. Okay. So we've already kind of dipped into this a little bit, but um, do you have any favorite teams and drivers? Obviously Lewis, um, anyone else? I'd say mostly pulling for Lewis and Mercedes and then just gearing up to turn over all of my my black and silver gear for red next year. But for now, I'm just looking forward to anybody that can contend with Max. You know, will these upgrades from McLaren shoot Lando back into contention for race wins? Can Charles steal a few or Carlos? I just want to see some parity on the, on the top of the grid this year and just see some action. I think it's going to be very predictable in the running order between now and the regulation changes in 2026. So just looking to see things spice up. Nice. So is it some, is there something about Lewis aside from like him just being amazing and you kind of coming in right when he was kind of taken off with his career? Is there something other than that, that like kind of draws you to him? I'm just curious. Cause like a lot of people, when they hear like, oh, you're a Lewis fan, you must have watched drive to survive. Like, I feel like that's like always like, the, <laughs> that's always like the segue into, oh, you're a Lewis fan. You must watch drive to survive. Did you watch drive to survive? <laughs> I did watch Drive to Survive, and and you know, luckily, I can talk about my origin story and going to Lewis's first race. And I do, you know, luckily, I've I've sort of earned my spot in the Lewis fandom without catching too much flack. I really do like what Lewis has turned into as a spokesman for the sport, taking over from Seb on just speaking out for what he thinks is right and some of his activism through his helmets and some of the the free speech he's had on the race weekends. I really like how how he's handled things. And even moments like Abu Dhabi 2021, which is probably the most challenging moment of his career, he handled it with so much dignity and came back a new man the next year, just ready to to get back into it. So I've just been really impressed with what I've seen from Lewis all this way. Okay. So do you remember last year at the Miami press conference when he showed up with three watches and like four huge rings? <laughs> because he was protesting the F1 regulation rule that then did not allow drivers to wear jewelry. I did. I did. And I think that's, that's all part of this, this great expression that Lewis has going into countries that have laws against LGBTQ rights and wearing a rainbow helmet and speaking at, you know, he's one of the only drivers in the pack for F1 Academy. It's just all part of what we've come to love about Lewis. Cool. I love it. All right. So I guess with that, we have concluded all of our questions, but I have one more. I have one more. Um, so Adam has a daughter. She is a youngin and close to my son's age. And I'm curious, does she like motorsport yet? Unfortunately, my five-year-old's a boy too. Oh, I thought you were, I thought you had a girl. I have two boys. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> they do. Perfect. They do love motorsport. Um, the week that I had Chris McCarthy on the podcast, we actually watched the Saudi Arabia F1 kids together, which is super, super cool to watch. And he ended up watching the whole Grand Prix. It's the first time we've done it together. And he always asked me, where's Lewis? Where's George? Can you point to him? How fast are they going? So they're starting to get into the sport now, which is such a cool moment as a dad that I can start bringing my sons into it. That's awesome. That's really awesome. We're not ready to bring our kids to a race yet, not by any means, um, but we do watch the races and it's it's pretty fun on the weekends to be able to root for um, Ferrari. Um, <laughs> my, my son Brooks is like, his favorite color is red. He's always like, Ferrari, Ferrari. And Lynette and her husband came over the other weekend and her husband <laughs> taught taught my kids, um, some, you know, Ferrari lingo. So it was very fun. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah Start so him young. Yes. Yeah, so another thing for a Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. In the house. Um, although Brady, my other one, he's, his favorite color is orange. So he's a McLaren fan through and through. And, um, we wear our McLaren shirts when we go, go karting and all that. So he's, <laughs> we're kind of torn. I feel like house, house divided. <laughs> and that's going to be a fun rivalry for a long time. Yeah. And then my husband's a Max, somewhat of a Max fan. So, um, so yeah, so we've got all the houses being represented. I feel like <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah. Lynette doesn't have to worry about that. She's got one and one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, quick question before we conclude this episode, I was curious speaking of Ricardo, um, what do you feel like his fate is looking like towards the end of the season? Um, you had said his value is super low in fantasy and we were kind of talking about his results. 
Um, as of right now, do you see him being in Formula One next year? I tend to be a little bit more critical of the current grid just because we have so many young drivers that deserve a spot in the grid next year. We saw what Liam Lawson could do last year. We saw Ali Behrman earlier this year. Meanwhile, we have multiple Formula 2 champions that are just all backed up as reserve drivers or another series. So I think we need to clear out at least two, three, maybe even four seats on the grid to make room for some of these guys. And if someone like Vettel is really considering coming back to the sport, maybe it's even more than that. So unless Danny Rick can turn it around, I think he might be one of those people that's the odd man out next year. And it'll be really interesting to see if that new chassis he got last race, he started having a slightly better racecraft in the earlier sessions and then that DNF really derailed his weekend. Can he turn around in Miami because he needs a few good races in a row before that team starts to pull the trigger early? Because I think it was only 10 races in last year that Nick DeVries took a hike and Danny Rick came in. So time's running out. For sure. Okay. Well, that's all the questions I have. Lynette, do you have any others? Yeah, I think we covered everything. Good. Well, this is wonderful. Thanks so much for having me. I had a blast tonight. Yeah, we have to have you again sometime soon. I know. <laughs> I'd love this that. has been great. Yeah, Maybe we'll have to have it in the beginning of next year so we can really get our teams in order and prepare. <laughs> yeah, and talk that about sounds how good. We did this year. Between between now and then, you guys have the red phone. You can just call me up if you need fantasy advice. <laughs> I'll set you up any week you need. And then also, um, we may just have to have a recap episode at the end of the season to like because we know you're going to win. So, just... <laughs> hey, I'm I'm, your... I'm hanging back there, <laughs> pretty close. <laughs> Listen, okay. so my my limitless chip last year, I used it at Coda, and then later in the day, I found out Lewis and Charles both had that disqualification, and my team went into the tank for a while. So anything can happen with it this week, and Lynette could come right back. Okay, limitless tri chip, Lynette. We're using that this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Please don't forget, if you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. And you can always comment on our YouTube videos. We will answer back. Join us on FanAmp. That is so important to us to be able to communicate with you guys. You can ask us any questions at any time. We talk about races during the weekend and all that jazz. Um, also, please give us a follow on Instagram and TikTok and leave us a review only five stars on Apple Podcasts. <laughs> and with that, we will talk to you guys in a couple of days after qualifying. <laughs> Thanks. Bye.